Perfect. Okay, we're ready to go. So um, our next speakers are Nick Shepard and Joanna Brown. Nick is the Open Research Advisor at the University of Leeds, and he's the Senior Lead for the Knowledge Equality Network. He, sorry, Knowledge Equity Network. Nick is particularly interested in the potential of the Wikimedia suite of tools for sharing research with a global audience and how it relates to open and inclusive education. And he also advocates for universities to proactively engage with Wikimedia and has co-led initiatives at the University of Leeds. Sorry. <coughs> um, right. And Dr. Joanna Brown is a senior learning technologist in the Faculty of Biological Sciences at the University of Leeds. She has over 15 years experience as a learning technologist and instructional designer in higher education. Her PhD and postdoctoral work in maths and mechanical engineering was concerned with 3D surface modeling and printing. And she has many interests, including the use of Wikimedia in learning and teaching, open education, accessibility and inclusivity, sustainability, and the use of XR in learning and teaching. Um, so take it away. Thanks, Jen. Um, can everybody hear me okay? It's always a bit discombobulating when you're talking to a computer. I still find that even now, I should be used to it. Um, and I'm also looking at my slides, so I can't see the chat, etc. Um, so I'll have to be here to advance them. But hello, everyone. Lovely to be here and to talk to you today about open research. Um, I need to get on with things. We've got far too many slides, as is my want. But um, uh, just to say that an important aspect of the collaboration between Joanna and I, and Joanna will come in at the end to talk a bit about our Wikimedia Champions project, is our different perspectives. And I think that and Wikimedia in general is a really powerful way of bringing together um, open research and uh, open education um, from our respective perspectives. But I just want to start by asking you a couple of questions. I won't spend too long on this, but have you ever heard of Wilson Armistead? Um, and or what do you know about cryogenic electron microscopy? Um, so just Google it or Bing or DuckDuckGo, your uh, uh, search engine of choice. Uh, I'd be interested to hear in the chat, as I say, I can't actually see the chat at the moment, but where is Wikipedia in the, in the results that you get back? I'm guessing it's very near the top. And then perhaps just post a quick fact um, about either or both Wilson Armistead or cryogenic electron microscopy um, and identify the source of that information. Um, I'd like to spend a bit more time on that, but I'll, I'll leave that to, to you to, to do. I mean, we'll, we'll come back to this as, as we go, but uh, interested to, in particular, whether or not it does actually appear at the top of the um, results in Google, because I mean, you're never quite sure the algorithm, how it works with Google in terms of how, what it knows about you, etc. Uh, but I'll come back to Wilson in a, in a, in a moment. Um, so what we'll talk about today is uh, initially Wikipedia. I think I'm guessing most people are familiar with what well, I'm sure everybody's familiar with Wikipedia is the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit, but also how that fits into the broader Wikimedia ecosystem, which is actually just one of 16 interconnected projects um, notably in the context of today's conversation, Wikimedia Commons and Wikidata, um, and then discuss how that all together um, fulfills the visions of open research and open education, um, I think. Um, and then, uh, as I say, hand over to Joanna at the end to talk a little bit about our Wikimedia Champions project here at Leeds. So as I say, ubiquitous, the free encyclopedia that anyone can edit. I could hear some comments. I'm guessing people are commenting, but I can't actually see the chat. So. But it's going to be near the top, you know. I know the results for those are going to be through the near the top, whatever search engine you use. Um, it's at the top the for everyone so far. Right, right, great. <laughs> um, so, and, and the point to, to make about this um, really as well, in terms of, again, I don't know if people have, have identified facts and where that's sourced from. But this is a quote from a, an article that Martin Poulter and I co authored in 2020. So, Martin Poulter, uh, who we'll talk about as we go along today, is uh, well, he was a Wikimedian in residence, as known at the Bodleian in, in Oxford. He's been, uh, he now works as an independent consultant, and uh, I've done a lot of work with him around promoting Wikimedia as a tool. Um, and his, he says, this is his quote in that paper, it doesn't compete with the scholarly literature, it makes it accessible to the widest possible audience. And that improving an article means that more, not fewer people read the peer validated literature because readers follow links to cite, cited sources. Um, there's some data there from Crossref. It's a little bit old, it's from 2015. Uh, I'm pretty sure Martin's gone now, but I'll have to get in touch with Martin to ask if we could get more up-to-date data. Um, but what this is showing is that um, Wikipedia is a major source of DOI resolutions, the sixth back in 2015. So, you know, I think we all know implicitly that people are going to Wikipedia and looking 
for uh, you know a starting point and then following the onward links through to um, the uh, cited research. There's perhaps a few misconceptions about Wikipedia, how it actually works. There certainly were for me, you know, it is a permanent evolving source of verified information. There's a lot, it's a transparent record of edits over time. Every article has a talk page, for example, where you can have discussions with the community around improvements, etc. It's based on a set of fundamental principles um, with a various sort of standards of page. So there's a stub page, a start page, a good article, a featured article page. That's all sort of um, part of the collaborative environment. There's issues of bias, as there are in fact in the published literature. So only, I think it might have gone up a bit now, but 18% of bias are about women compared to men um, and major discriminators in geographical coverage, for example. There's more articles about the Netherlands and the whole continent of Africa, which is obviously a, a reflective of society at large, as well as the platform and the type of people that are editing it. And of course, um, Wikipedia is only as good and as diverse as its contributors. So that's part of what I think you know we'd like to advocate is that more people need to be involved in actually editing it and being part of that community. In terms of open access, I think um, Andy Tattersall is probably on the call and he has, I think he spoke about this in a bit more detail yesterday for the on-site event for this um, the conference yesterday for OpenFest. But we, uh, along with Andy and colleagues from York, uh, did a study um, which is linked uh, on here. I've got references at the end as well. Uh, with data extracted from arthmetric.com, trying to understand uh, how many citations were across the White Rose universities using the White Rose Research Online repository and uh, what proportion was open access. So as you can see, we found nearly 6,500 citations across the White Rose universities. This was back in April 2019, uh, broke, broken down as, as stated there. Um, and only approximately 50% were open access. Uh, a lot more detail in the paper in Insights, uh, which in, notably, I'll just note actually is actually linked to the White Rose version, not to the DOI, because that didn't work yesterday, um, which I suppose ties in with some of the stuff that Martin was talking about. Um, and there are currently, uh, it's gone up an awful lot, because I actually manually add a lot of links myself if I find an article, etc., including Wilson Armistead. So that's actually a Wikipedia article that I wrote or started to write, so it's been contributed by to by others, based on um, a paper at Leeds um, where I discovered this character, Wilson Armstead, I was fascinated by him. He didn't have a Wikipedia page, so I wrote one with Martin's help um, and linked to the open access version in the White Rose repository because that's actually behind a paywall. So there are well over a thousand links to Row now. As of yesterday, I checked that it's gone up uh, at least twice over the past few years. Worth mentioning at this point that Wikipedia is very sensitive to conflict of interest. Um, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate, say, for uh, you know, Nike, someone from Nike to edit the article on sweatshops or whatever. And that can cause a bit of uh, um, conflict or frustration, perhaps for university employees potentially editing that. There's absolutely no reason you can't do it. I do it routinely. I'll add links to open access papers or even cite stuff from the, the University of Leeds. On my profile on Wikipedia, I've got a conflict of interest statement. It, it states that I, I'm employed by the University of Leeds, um, but that I'm at editing the encyclopedia in good faith etc so there's ways around that and you can use the talk page etc you can also use text from suitably licensed papers directly into wikipedia there's actually a template there you can see to fully cite the source paper and indicate that it's been copied as well as cited and over here on the right hand side this is data from the white rose research online repository showing that again tallies with the the finding from crossref that wikipedia is a significant source of data um of, of referrals through to uh, the open access versions in the repository. So as I say, if I ever find a, a cited reference to Altmetric or whatever, I'll just quickly add the, the open access link through to um, the White Rose repository because, you know, lay people or people without subscription, et cetera, you know, it's it, it, it's obviously beneficial that they can actually access that research without going to hit in a paywall. But as I say, Wikipedia is just one of um, many uh, tools within the ecosystem. The two I'll talk about today, which have a special role in providing um, digital media or data to other projects, as well as sites and applications external to Wikimedia, Wikimedia Commons and Wikidata. And actually, conflict of interest is less of an issue with both of these platforms um, than it is with Wikipedia. There's no real issue, you, reason you can't upload all sorts of material um, without worrying too much about COI to these platforms. Um, again, I guess people might be familiar with these, but Wikimedia Commons is a repository of openly licensed media files, so photographs, diagrams, video, audio. So that could be the openly licensed um, diagrams, etc., from uh, an open license paper um, that can go into Wikipedia and then be used to embed into a relevant article on Wikipedia or used in any other context. Whereas Wikidata is a knowledge graph that represents knowledge through the connections between things. 
Um, so, you know, a paper as an author, as a nationality, a name and a date of birth, and they graduate from a particular university, which in turn has a geographical location, a vice chancellor, and a notable alumni, and so on. So that can be read and edited by humans on machine, and then you can do all sorts of clever things with uh, Sparkle and visualization. Um, Martin loves this stuff. I'm not terribly uh, good at it, but if you know a bit of code, even I can hack it around a bit. I'll show you some examples just to get a flavor of what's possible. I mean, your imagination is the only limit, really. It's also the fastest growing Wikimedia project. Uh, it broke through 100 million items a couple of years ago, I think. So um, if I had more time, I'd show you some specific examples. I'll mention them in passing, and there's all links in these slides that I'll pass on in, um, in uh, more detail. But so, you know, to come back to open research, Wikimedia, um, Wikipedia is the most popular information site on the modern web, um, invariably among the top hits for any academic topic. There's actually a really interesting paper um, that's a sort of editorial in nature that summarizes this uh, preprint that Wikipedia actually shapes language in science papers. So this was an experiment that showed that words and phrases in recently published Wikipedia articles subsequently appeared more frequently in the scientific literature. So, I mean, that's really interesting that people might not be actually acknowledging it, but as Thompson, the author said, you know, it's actually um, sort of at odds with academia, you know, it's, it's sort of an unspoken thing. It's a really important information source and it's it's important that I think that we engage in more constructive ways about. All content's obviously freely licensed in the public domain, so it rules out non-commercial, no derivative licenses. Um, you can reuse, as I say, appropriately licensed research outputs on Wikimedia platforms to help reach and educate a large audience beyond the acad academy, academy, academy um, and credit the source publication through the DOI or full citation or whatever. And once on Wikimedia, text, media or data can be contextualized, translated or built upon which fulfills the um, visions of both open research and open um, education. So we do, do a lot of uh, translation as part of our Wikimedia Champions project, for example, that um, I think uh, Joanna will mention, and I will let hand over to you very soon, uh, Joanna. So as I say, Wikimedia Commons, dead straightforward to upload figures and other files from suitably licensed research outputs, um, available then for on hundreds of sites, can very easily be embedded. So that's where files are embedded into um, Wikipedia articles. Also contains rich descriptions and metadata, it's just a repository in effect, with a full citation and DOI to the source paper or data set. Uh, even when media have been generated with code. So you can see this uh, animated GIF there of Supernova I discovered from 1885 that's just running through populating itself over, over time. If you actually see that on Wikimedia Commons, it's got the Python code used to generate it and links to the source data set. Um, every edit is also recorded and permanently archived. So the history tab almost acts as a version control um, for any updated or corrected code. That's a nice example. Um, Wikimedia projects are available in around 300 languages. Um, so, uh, again, Joanna might talk a little bit more about this, but um, if you have a SVG format, it take, makes it dead easy to edit text labels. So in the context of knowledge equity, for example, we've done a lot of translation work um, with a particular example that um, Joanna will show you. This example, again, you'll find on Wikimedia Commons is a visualization of the peat map data set, which is just extracted from a, an openly, from openly licensed research paper uploaded to Commons. Um, it now has been used, not through me, but just the community finding it and using it to illustrate articles about Pete in six different languages, some of which I don't even know what languages they are, actually. If you look, it's all listed there on the Wikimedia Commons page. And that now gets more than half a million views a year. Um, and the data set there, that's the DOI in our data repository at Leeds, is by far our most popular data set. Um, as, you know, presumably traffic or the profile is raised through that, um, et cetera. I'm not going to say too much about Wikidata because I'm no expert, but I just want to give you a quick flavor before over to Joanna. It contains secondary data about more, as I say, more than 100 million entities. It's X as a hub for the web of linked open data. Um, research outputs of any size can potentially be visible on Wikidata. It's less concern about conflict of interest, as I say. Individual and conclusions even can be added to Wikidata's knowledge graph um, with a citation to the research paper or identifiers from large online databases added in bulk. And you can then do sort of all sorts of clever visualizations through the Wikidata query ser service with Sparkle. Um, and even I, and I'm no quote coder, could sort of hack around some interesting queries. And really, your imagination is the limit. Lots of great examples from uh, Edinburgh that, uh, again, I won't have time to go into in any detail, but do have a look at those. I'll just tell you about this one, though, um, which is uh, a nice sort of example of the type of thing you can do. So this was Martin, as I say, loves writing uh, Sparkle queries. So Dr. Chris Hassel, uh, Associate Professor of Anna, Animal biology was an academic colleague who was working with us on the um, case study of the uh, uh, 
Champions Project. And he's interested in endangered species. We know Wikipedia article so we can get his students to research and write one. So Martin was able to write a, a quick query um, to find the conservation statuses and number of taxa in Wikidata. There's a link to the query there. Um, and then uh, another query to actually um, generate the results of, you know, that are represented in Wikimedia, but no English Wikipedia article that then, you know, his students could potentially research and actually um, write an article about. So I think that's a quite a nice example of the type of thing that how it can then cross over with, with education. Um, but I think I've left you exactly five minutes, uh, Joanna. So yes, thanks, you. Nick. That's perfect timing. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 that's great. Good. So the Wikimedia Champions Project and how it began. So Nick's mentioned the University of Edinburgh. So I was up in Edinburgh and I was talking to Melissa Highton, who she described all the work they've been doing in the undergraduate curriculum up in Edinburgh. And it was quite inspirational. So I came back to Leeds and the so there happened to be an open lunch event that Nick had organised where he was talking about Wikimedia and the Global Commons. So I went along to that and heard that there was some spare funding um, from the Research England part. And so Nick had said, if anyone has ideas, just to share them with him. So what I came up with was an idea to explore a project use, with working with postgraduate researchers. So most of the educational work had previously been done um, with undergraduates, but we 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 brought together a, a project with postgraduates. So the team, so Nick and I have been primarily led the team, but Martin Poulter, who's been mentioned earlier as well, has been involved in helping support the students. But also we've had um, Chris Hassel, an academic, as well uh, on the project. So next slide, please. So this is an overview of what we've done. Um, again, it was a quick turnaround for the project. So um, we've had two two pilots. Last summer, we had two postgraduates. And this year, we've had seven. Um, last year, it was from the Faculty of um, Biological Sciences, where I'm based as a learning technologist. Um, this year, we've expanded it, and there's been four faculties involved, so art, including arts, humanities, and cultures, environment, um, etc. Um, paid work. So the students were paid. It's like demonstration rates. So they were paid for per hour. Um, last year, it was about eight weeks. This year, we had much longer to do the work, so two months, up to 80 hours per student last year and 60 this year. Last year, the admin was done within the faculty, but because we broadened it, then we shifted it to the library, which took quite a bit of setting up. Um, OK, next slide, please. Yeah, the benefits so far, and we, we will be writing these up and showing them more widely, but it, this, this is hot off the press. It's, there's been some really delightful benefits that we've seen. Um, the skills of the students in all kinds of areas have, have improved. So information, information literacy, communication skills and, and teamwork, especially this year, because the seven have had contact with each other as well. Uh, there's been a greater understanding by them of, of obviously Wikipedia and Wikimedia, but also open education more generally and motivation because they're producing content for general the general public. It's actually there's agency and motivation involved in that. It's not just for a few viewers. So next slide, please, Nick. Yeah, this um, and another some other surprises are the work that they there was some freedom within the project for them to choose what they wanted to do. So I'd imagine there'd be a lot of work with text, but quite a number of the students have wanted to work with infographics. And so there wasn't um, any graphics, um, good graphics des describing uh, cryo -electron micro cryogenic electron microscopy. So we did some sketches and then work with a graphic designer and, and my team. And next slide, uh, Nick. Uh, that's what we ended up with, with that, again, teamwork. This was last summer's work. And as Nick has, so this is in the CSV format. So we would then, Nick has been uh, avidly getting uh, language translations. So this is an Arabic one, obviously, uh, switched as well from left to right to right to left. Um, yes, that's it. Um, and then I think we've got about seven language translations so far. And that can then be used in the other, it's in um, 
uh, the commons area and it can be used in the different language translations of Wikipedia. Um, next slide, Nick. We There was also some money in the comms budget. So I'd worked with poets before. So we within a couple of months, there were a poem, poets commission, poems written and recorded. And there's links to those for you to look at later. So that's describing the work of Wikimedia in education. Next slide, please. And as well, the first lot of students we created a podcast with. So, and that's available to listen to hear of their experiences on that project. This year, we've had um, a number of international students. And also, Nick mentioned there's been gaps in Wikimedia in different cultures. So. One of them, for example, is putting content about an underrepresented Indian poet um, from the Tamil, the Tamil language. So we've, the, the group we've had has also been addressing some of those aspects and it and also gender related as well. I'll hand back to Nick now. With a Great, we've got a minute left. left. Great. Yeah, I think we're, that's just perfect timing. I think we're, that, that worked better than we thought, uh, Joanna. So yeah, that's great. Um, I've got a few references there, lots of links. I'm sure we'll share these slides, um, including that podcast um, and various uh, talks we've done around this stuff. And as Joanna says, we will be writing this in more detail. A few acknowledgements there, a special thanks to Martin Poulter and all our Wikimedia champions and to Research England and the Open Research Advisory Group at the University of Leeds. Um, and uh, please to get in touch if you'd like to, to, to learn more.